Up next, sometimes a song or an album comes out and it changes the course of music history. In 1980, a metal album did just that. Today, we tell the story of a heavy metal classic from an exclusive interview with the chairman of the genre on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Make sure to subscribe right now below to get exclusive stories from the greatest artists ever. And check us out on Patreon for even more content. Now it's time for another episode of our series, Revelations. This is where featured artists reveal rare stories about their greatest songs and their greatest albums. Now Judas Priest was formed in Birmingham uh, in 1969. In the 70s, they were pioneers of heavy metal, no doubt about it. You know, continually innovating and recruiting new believers. But commercial success had at that point eluded them and they hadn't connected perfectly with their signature sound. Now that all changed as the decade switched from the 70s to the 80s. On April 14, 1980, Rob Halford and Judas Priest released the heavy metal masterwork, British Steel, with its equally legendary album cover. It scared the crap out of me when I was a kid. It was Priest's first album with Dave Holland on drums, British Steel was the band perfecting what they had explored on their previous studio album, Killing Machine, from 1978. Only it wasn't as uh, dark uh, lyrically as some of the songs on Killing Machine and other earlier records. Rob Halford has said in the past, that the band was taken with their contemporaries, ACDC. Judas Priest had toured with the band on their European leg of that tour at the end of the 70s. Both ACDC and Judas Priest would revolutionize the 80s with their next albums after that fateful tour. You think about it, ACDC would go global with Back in Black, one of the biggest albums ever. Judas Priest would really start knocking people out with British Steel and the great songs that they released from that record, including the Rebel Anthem, Breaking the Law. Breaking the law, breaking the law, breaking the law, breaking the law. United. United, 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 we stand. And the sensational Living After Midnight. Now this helped Judas Priest obtain their first gold record. This British Steel would eventually sell over a million copies, million records. And metal was never the same again after that. Both Break of the Law and Living After Midnight connected with young people coming of age at that moment, you know, it evoked a rebellious spirit at the end of the 70s into the early uh, 1980. It was a time of gas lines, unrest, high unemployment, and mistrust in the leaders who were promising uh, the opposite. People were looking for music, you know, that spoke to what they were experiencing, to what they were going through in life. And heavy metal, punk, and new wave answered that call. It answered the bell. Rob Halford and Judas Priest were at the forefront of this movement. And what follows is an interview that I did with Rob on the creation of the album British Steel and the story of Living After Midnight. Rob also tells us about his origin story and what personally inspired his path to creating this life-changing music. Here's Rob Halford with the story. You've been a trailblazer in so many ways, Rob. I'd like to start by having you take us back to your decision to wear your studded leather, crack your whip on stage. Very iconic look. It has inspired so many bands. What made you decide to introduce that look? I love the way that that part of Judas Priest has become such an important representation of what we're about and what we do. When you think about the music that you love, it kind of runs in parallel with, with the imagery. The great story about Judas Priest with that, that whole aspect of, of image, when we began in those very, very early years of being a, a band, um, we were at a remarkable time in music because the first rumblings of heavy metal, the heavy metal sound were starting to generate. 
And we were just as experimental and probably to a certain extent uncertain about how this was all going to coalesce, how it was going to gain substance. And it did that in those those early moments of the songs on Rock and Roller, where you, you can sense those those roots of heavy metal starting to take place. At the same time, you're gaining some traction as a band. You're getting a fan base. Your pictures are being taken. You're doing photo shoots. Well, what do you wear? You know, and you you really are not re- thinking that deeply about that side of it because it's always about the music matters most. Even now, it doesn't matter how many lights you've got, how many costumes you've got, how many motorcycles you've got. The music is what is the anvil. That's what keeps it all grounded. As you're developing as a band, and I guess this is for, for, for quite a few bands, you start to look at yourself and you start to feel that there's an opportunity to display outwardly this, 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 uh, this effect, this costume, this, this um, statement by wearing certain clothes that starts to connect with the music. And that's the great thing about, a, 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 you know, if, if you put on just a regular leather motorcycle jacket, that says a lot. That says a lot about your attitude. It says a lot about um, the music that you're probably into. And so this is how it was with Priest, how we, we took those, those, early, those early expressions and started to fine tune them with a simple leather biker jacket and going, you know, this, this looks good, man. Yeah, this really, this really correlates here with the, the heaviness and the, and the excitement and the energy of the music. And so the natural feeling is, well, what, what else can we add to it? You know, what are the other um, accessories that we can make uh, that will really really bring the metal home in all of its glory. And so you start to uh, look around for all of these different um, simple opportunities, like a whip, for example, you know, or, or, some, or some studded wristbands, you know, or, or, uh, or some leather pants. And, and all of this is building, building and building at the same time that your band is building, the same time your band is gaining traction with more fans, you're going out from your own country into another country, you're traveling further, you're spreading the heavy metal gospel of priest, as we still like to call it. It defines you so much that now when you talk about priest, you always see this thing in your, this, this picture in your head. Uh, uh, and there it is, you know, the leather, the whips, the chains, the studs. It's just been this great um, catalyst for a lot of, a lot of other bands that um, looked to Priest in those early metal imagery days and said, you know, these guys are onto something. Let's try and take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and, and utilize it in our own definition. But it's a beautiful story, Adam, and it's a very important one because it, it also spreads deeper into uh, all of the things that you do as a band. This band was so huge for us kids, us outcasts, as you would call them, because, you know, I grew up in a small town and Heavy metal and new wave were like the two fists that we had to express ourselves. We owe a debt of gratitude, not only the bands to you, but uh, us as the outcast for, for the music that was our music. You know, that's, that's really important what you're saying. You, you have to remember that your music is reaching into every single place that it can go to. Whether it's, you know, in rural America, whether it's the heart of a big city, um, whether it's in the jungle somewhere, you know, in the desert, Middle East, this is the power of music and especially with metal. And I love this word that you're using, outcast, because, um, again, particularly as a younger person, uh, you feel like an outcast. That's just a part of growing up. doesn't matter who you are. doesn't matter, you know, what your circumstances are. There's a point in your life when you're trying to figure a lot of stuff out, particularly as you're going from a, a kid into your early uh, adulthood and your music is your only friend so you do feel you do feel like an outcast 
in the, the beginnings of the metal scene, we were an outcast. Our music was kind of an outcast under the big umbrella of rock and roll because so many people didn't understand it. Like they couldn't figure it out. You know, why these people? What is it with this music? I, I, I don't, I don't. You know, it doesn't work for me. We were kind of marginalised for 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 quite a while, and ironically enough, particularly in the, that punk and new wave uh, uh, era. Um, where metal, heavy metal, was like a dirty word, you know. You weren't played on the radio, you weren't in a magazine, you were just push, you know, it's over. But we, the outcasts, we, uh, is there a band called the outcasts? Because there should be. Um, they, uh, you know, we stuck together, didn't we? And then we go into this beautiful conversation about uh, the metal community. You came from a working class family just outside of Birmingham, England, and your family faced many hardships and you know how did those struggles forge your path and what became heavy metal and what became your your voice i value that just because as a person growing up you carry a lot of what's happened to you in your childhood through the rest of your adult life i have very very vivid memories a lot of which are in confess that i'm sharing with everybody for the first time in certain instances um but I, I'm grateful for that. I, I'm grateful that, um, you know, watching my dad go to work every day and working in the steel factories and so forth and blue collar type of environment and, you know, just to, just to bad enough money and the wage packet to pay for the rent and the food for the week and all this kind of stuff, you know, that, that really, really helped you get a focus on what was real and what was uh, vital and useful and uh, what was kind of um, not that important. You know, you really figured out what was what was important to you through those early childhood years. And uh, it's, it's, it's important to reflect upon. British Steel, hugely successful LP, you know, reached number four on the album chart in the UK, number 34 on the Billboard album chart here in the US. Sold over a million copies, but incredible tracks on British Steel. You've given a lot of credit for the success of the album's producer, Tom Allam. He was about every instrument standing out and sounding bigger and uh, making the process less complicated. Was that philosophy a bit counterintuitive for you and your mates? We went to work with Tom, very open-minded in terms of a, of a production producer sent because producers are vital. And uh, even now we, do, we use producers, you know, once you give up on producers, that's, you know, you're losing so much. We went in with Tom uh, for the first time to make a proper studio album, as you want to define it, after we mixed on Unleashed in the East together. We just had a good feeling about the guy because a lot of the things he was saying made absolute sense, particularly about taking away all the excessiveness, all the clutter that 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 can kind of um, let your mind wander musically. You know, how many lead breaks do you need? You know, how many verses does a song need? How many you know things need to happen on the drums? He had this very um, this very uh, direct approach of, of simplification. And um, I think he used to reference people like the Beatles, the simplicity of their, their music. It was just so pure and, and, and organic, really. So we went in, into the studio with Tom with very few ideas for, for the music. I mean, there's the famous story of Glenn and, and Living After Midnight. But... Um, as soon as we started working with him, what we heard back from the speakers was just so exciting and was so um, inspirational. You're driven, you know, we, we, were, we were literally being driven from song to song because most of that record was, was written um, at that place. Uh, but his, his importance to Priest from that point on can't be overstated, you know, all of the other great records that he made with us. And, and we did go into some extraordinary ter territory in terms of production. Not the, diff the production difference between, say, um, British Steel and Screaming for Vengeance is vast. Yeah. 
it's it's vast to some extent. He's a great man and he's still very valuable and, and he just showed his chops yet, yet again, uh, most recently with the uh, firepower. Well, living after midnight, let's talk about that. The theme of the song was spawned after you were uh, rudely awakened from a deep sleep by <laughs> the guitar playing of one Glenn Tipton. Yeah. Tell me about that. That's a great story. It's funny, you know, because again, when you make music, it can come from the most extraordinary places. Some of the simplest songs have, have come out of somebody noodling on the, on the guitar in the chord, and you go, what is that riff? You know, what riff? That riff you just played, you have to get it quickly because a lot of guitar noobs will be, you know, doing the, you know, da 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 What is that? What? Did that thing you just played? What was it just what you played 30 seconds ago? Oh, this da 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 da. Yeah, that's a really good riff, man. Keep that. So it was with me trying to get to some sleep, get some sleep after midnight uh, in the bedroom that was above the room that Glenn had said his 100 watt Marshall stack up and he was blasting away, you know, and I'm like, oh God, I gotta get some rest, I gotta get some vocals tomorrow. Singers need their rest. So I stumble downstairs, and he, you know, he's in the, in the room, head banging and by himself. <laughs> but I mean, he looks at me and he stops. Yeah, you all right, Rob? I go, yeah, Glenn, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, man, but my, you know, my bedroom is directly above you. Yeah, well, I'm trying to get to get some sleep. And I'll, look, man, it's, it's after midnight. It's like you're living after midnight down here. That's a great song title. Rob, we've got to use that title. So there, there came the, the, the title. I think Glenn was just playing the, what was the actual chorus part of uh, Living After Midnight. And we put the rest of the material together shortly after that. But um, it's a beautiful story because it happened in a very special place where we made a very special album. Do you remember anything that stands out when you recorded? Do you record it the very next day or how did that come together? It's a little bit murky in, in terms of the sequence. I mean, we never took notes. I mean, I know some bands would take notes. On this day, we wrote British Steel at 4.30 in the afternoon on a Friday. We never did that. We never did that. But um, I'm pretty sure that the next day we got into the, the main chops of that particular song and um that simple drum beat because it starts with the drums bop, 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 bop. even now t uh, drums which are the anchor of every song to start a song like that is just perfect you know and uh, it, it's just a little a little trigger to to what's going to happen next and when the whole the guitars and the rest of the band come crushing in it, it's remarkable but um no you know that one and and um metal gods and grinder rapid fire A lot of it was so spontaneous, um, and that's a, that's one of the joyful memories we have around that uh, particular album. Well, we where we were on a cycle that preceded uh, British Steel of. Uh, my, literally making an album a year, every year. We went through an extraordinary period where we were making a record nearly every year, you know. How can you do that? But um, the spontaneity, the, the, the energy, the enthusiasm, all the excitement about being in this band and the things that you were doing, it, it really fires you up. Uh, um, and and the, the, that metal fire was really roaring through the British Steel sessions. British Steel is such a pivotal record. Thanks for watching. Leave us a comment about Rob Halford and Judas Priest. What is your favorite track from this classic record and why? Let us know in the comments.
What are your memories of this time in metal or the first time you discovered it? I'd love to hear that. If you like our videos, we do invite you to subscribe below to be a part of our community. Uh, remember to get even more content and help our mission of getting the stories behind all these great artists and their songs. Hit us up on Patreon. Help us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth. We'll see you soon.